Welcome to week seven. We are covering lecture 14, which is an introduction to taxation, which we have touched on briefly. And the prescribed reading is Stiglitz and Rosengard chapter 17. Specifically, what this lecture covers uh, is the forms of taxation, the changing patterns of taxation in the United States, uh, comparisons with other countries, and also five desirable characteristics of any tax system. And then we will also look for look at uh, choosing among tax systems from a number of tax systems. A specific characteristic of taxation is that taxation is compulsory. If you recall, what happens is that uh, taxes are used to fund public goods. Yet, the reason why we need to fund public goods is because there's no incentive for the private market to provide these public goods. So that is why we do need taxation to fund these public goods, because there's no incentive on an individual basis, a private market basis, to fund these public goods. So hence, that's why we make taxes compulsory. What are the forms of taxes that we have? Well, we can uh, classify taxes into two broad categories. So first of all, we, what we have is we have direct taxes, and these are taxes that are charged on the income earned by individuals and also or corporations. And what we have is so-called indirect taxes. And these are taxes on a variety of goods and services. For example, a value added tax. In the US, there are three principal direct taxes at a federal level. So what we have is first we have an individual tax. So what happens is that individual earns an income and uh, part of that income is paid in taxes by the individual. Then what we have is we have a payroll tax. So this also comes off from the income of the individual, but is directly charged by the employer. And this is used to finance social security and other social programs. And then what we have is we have corporate tax, and that is tax that is charged on the income of corporations. So those are the three types of direct taxes that prevail or exist in the United States. But of course, this does not just apply to the United States. And you see very similar variants pretty much across all nations in the world. Then what we have is indirect taxes. So taxes such as custom duties levied on imports of goods uh, from abroad. So whenever you import something from abroad, what happens is you pay some kind of duty on these imports from abroad. So that is an indirect tax. There's also excise taxes on goods such as telephone services, air travels and luxuries. So, for example, when you purchase a flight ticket, you pay a certain part of that flight ticket in the form of a tax. So these are specific taxes that are imposed on specific services. Then what you have is you have a general sales tax, and that is a flat percentage tax on all retail sales of a broad category of goods. Uh, alternatively, you could also compare this to a value added tax that is used in numerous, tax, uh, in numerous countries. The difference between the value added tax is that's imposed at each stage of the production process as opposed to a sales tax, which is only imposed at the point of sale when a specific good is sold. How do these taxes contribute to the fiscus? Well, let's say that current receipts for the federal government are stated here. The breakdown is as follows. You have a very large portion coming from personal current taxes, in other words, personal income taxes. Then there's also contributions to Social Security, and these would mostly arise from payroll taxes. Um, interestingly, corporate taxes, which include um, a Federal Reserve revenue, uh, constitutes 12.7% of this total figure here. Then what we have is we have excise duties and custom duties. So this would include uh, charges for importing goods from uh, other countries. And then 4.7 constitutes other forms of revenue. So the largest taxes are social security taxes and also individual income taxes followed by then corporate taxes, which are far lower, with an argument being that potentially corporates should pay more tax because they earn so much more than individuals do. 
usually what you see is the corporate tax rates are lower than those that are charged on individuals. So how is it that uh, sources of revenues have changed? Well, if we look at personal income taxes, these have increased. So what we see is that income taxes in the 1940s were relatively low in terms of their contribution to total federal revenues. The, these then increased to around almost 50% and therefore contributed around almost 50% to total revenues. What we also have is we have rising social uh, insurance contributions. And one potential reason is due to the proliferation of this idea that there needs to be some kind of social security that is provided to the population. So uh, these have become, or social security insurance uh, contributions have become more important as a social insurance system developed. What has happened on the other hand is corporate income taxes have fallen and potentially this is attributable to the fact that um, companies have been given favorable tax rates uh, in order to encourage them to operate within a specific country. What we also have is we have falling excise duties. Um, and uh, so this, this as a source of revenue has increased, uh, decreased. And also what we have is we have a slight increase in other sources of revenues. So that is what the composition of the sources of revenues looks like and how it has changed over time between the 1940s and 2010. Next, what we have is a comparison with other countries. Uh, so what are the sources for numerous countries that belong to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development grouping? So as you see, some countries uh, receive a lot more than the United States in terms of revenues from taxes. So as you see for Canada, others a lot less. Um, if you look at France in terms of income and uh, taxes and uh, taxes on corporate profits, that is. On the other hand, uh, social security funding specifically with reference to France is a lot higher than that of uh, the United States. Um, and what we also see is a differentiation in patterns, whereas by Mexico has a very small contribution to revenues from social security, but a much larger contribution from sales and VAT taxes and any excise duties on specific goods and services. And as you look across the spectrum, what you see is that these patterns vary. One pattern that arises is that middle income countries such as Chile, Mexico and Turkey are particularly dependent upon the value added tax for it as a source of revenue. So what are the desirable characteristics of any tax system? Well, the very first thing is that it needs to be economically efficient. Recall that then whenever there is a redistributive process that takes place, there is a loss in efficiency. The idea is to maintain this loss to an absolute minimum. Second of all, a tax system should be simple, it should be relatively easy and inexpensive to administer. That is indeed the, uh, the case for some countries. That is my experience with the South African tax system, but not so much with the Dutch tax system, where there are boxes and boxes to fill out. Also, a tax system should be flexible, so it should respond easily to change economic circumstances. So, for example, it should be easy to increase and decrease tax rates as required by the state of the economy. A tax system, very important, also needs to be transparent in terms of political responsibility. So the question is, where are the revenues going? So what are people paying for? This is especially relevant in developing countries or less developed countries where there is a problem with accountability. And then a tax system needs to be fair in the relative treatment of individuals. And this can be tied down to those that earn more paying more and those that earn less paying less. 
In many developing countries, there is an important six attribute, and that is that the tax system should be corruption resistant. If there are high levels of corruption, then there is always the risk of a tax revolt. And alternatively, taxes that are paid do not find their way to where they should go, to the programs that they should go to. Instead, what happens is they go into politicians' pockets. And having lived in a developing country, I have seen this firsthand. So in the absence of market failures, the economy would allocate resources efficiently. But remember that one problem that arises is that taxes impact relative prices. And why do prices matter? Why? Because there are a signal for the allocation of resources. Now, what happens when we institute a tax? Well, what we have is we have a distortion. So for example, you see a price of 600 and then you have to pay um, another 150 pounds on top of that 600. So as you see, the price gets distorted. You pay more than the value of the item because of a tax. And because uh, the price is a signaling mechanism, directing resources to where it makes sense and where it's profitable to produce, you have a distortion. Taxes also have behavioral effects. So for example, income taxes may impact the length of time that individual stays in school by affecting the after tax return on education. Also, income taxes may impact the number of hours that are worked. The reason why is that um, if you work too many hours or if you work beyond a certain point, taxes are so high that it makes no sense to work anymore. So again, we see a distortion in the provision of labor. Income taxes also have an impact on how much you save and what you save, the form of savings. So for example, in some countries, you have a provident fund payment. Uh, so money comes off your salary towards a savings vehicle in the form of a provident fund or a pension fund. They do differ. And um, those deductions are tax deductible. So hence, they impact your tax burden. Then income taxation might also impact the age at which an individual retires. Taxation may impact not only the level of investment in firms, but also the form of investment, including the durability of machines. So in short, there is hardly an important research, uh, uh, resource allocation decision in an economy that is not impacted, but one form or the other by the presence of taxes, which are distortionary. What are the financial effects of taxation? So in real terms, it makes little sense whether an individual saves directly for his or her retirement or alternatively, whether there is a deduction from a salary. Well, what happens is with pension funds, as I mentioned on the previous slide, there is a deduction from a salary on the employer side. So the employer deducts from an employee's salary and invests this in a pension fund on behalf of the employee. Now, the result is such that firms invest their money in a different way than they would have had this not been the case. So for example, they invest these funds in uh, securities that are less risky in order to ensure that these securities are invested in comply with regulations of pension funds or what is required by pension fund regulation. So they cannot invest in highly risky securities because these are people's pension funds. Taxes also impact the way that the economy is organized. So many organizations um, are, see the effects of how real resources get allocated. And uh, this allocation of resources within an organization is intertwined with organizational effects. A tax system can also impact how money is raised. So how do firms raise money? They raise it either through issuing debt, and that will be in the form of bonds, or alternatively issuing equity. Now, for example, interest on bonds is tax deductible. So firms might favor issuing bonds right up until a specific point because of tax deductibility. Interest is treated as an expense. So hence, it will impact as to whether bonds are issued or equity is used. There are also general equilibrium effects. The imposition of a tax, uh, such as that on wages or on the return on capital, alters the equilibrium of the economy. 
A tax on interest may reduce the supply of savings and eventually the stock of capital. This in turn may induce the productivity or reduce the productivity of workers and their wages. So there are other repercussions in terms of productivity and the real economy. Tax is also associated with announcement effects. So what this means is that the effects of some taxes may be felt even before a tax is imposed. So think about uh, corporate tax and think about stock prices. How are stock prices determined? Well, stock prices are a function of the expected cash flows. Now, these cash flows will be reduced if it is anticipated that they will be taxed at a higher rate. So what is the result? The result is that the value of that specific stock and company, which is dependent upon its cash flows, which are now being reduced, declines. Then we can move on to the definition of distortionary and not distortionary taxation. So a non-distortionary tax is one that uh, no, can, nothing can be done about to alter a tax liability. So, for example, if one is paying lump sum tax, which means you pay a specific amount, whether you're earning something or whether you are earning absolutely nothing, you can do nothing about that. Then we would define this as a non-distortionary tax. Alternatively, we could call this a so-called head tax, a tax that one has to pay regardless of income or wealth. Even if you have nothing, you are still paying a tax and you can do nothing about it. So that is a non-distortionary tax. So the result is that there is no impact on behavior if we are paying a lump sum tax. Alternatively, if you are paying some kind of uh, proportional tax, well, you can avoid the tax burden by working less. So hence, there is a distortion that is introduced with this type of tax. So a proportional tax would then be a distortionary tax because it will distort behavior. It will change the allocation of resources. You will work less. And here we have this restated. So any tax on income is also distortionary. Individual can reduce her uh, or his tax liability simply by working less or by saving less. But taxation is not always negative. Sometimes what we can do is we can use a corrective tax to correct a situation uh, that is not desirable. And it can be designed in such a way so it does not interfere with economic efficiency. In other words, what we can do is we can design a tax in such a way that corrects a market failure. Recall the example when we had our marginal social cost differing from our marginal private cost associated with steel production. So when a producer of steel produced more output, that would generate pollution. And that pollution would then be borne by society or the effects of that solution would be borne on society. So the costs faced by that firm would differ from those of society. Well, how can we equate the marginal social cost and the marginal private cost? What we can do is we can impose a tax on a given industry to pay for those costs of pollution or the costs associated with pollution. Another aspect of a tax system is that it entails costs. So there are direct costs and indirect costs that are associated with collecting taxes. So, for example, you have to set up a tax office and you have to pay its employees. So those would be both direct and indirect costs that would appear there. So, for example, indirect costs will include compliance costs, uh, which include the time spent filling out tax forms. Uh, well, you don't pay money, but time is money. So there is a cost that is involved with that, the costs of record keeping and also the costs of services of accountants and tax lawyers. Uh, so the administrative costs of running a tax system depend on a number of factors. So companies need to file their taxes and uh, the filing process imposes additional burden on large corporations for reporting wage income of their employees and also capital gains. Uh, there's also costs associated with the costs of the complexity of the tax system or the complexity of the tax system. So, for example, I as an individual might need to incur the costs uh, of employing a tax consultant if I do not know how to file my taxes uh, because of the complexity of the tax system. And that is indeed the case in some European countries where the tax system is very complex. 
Some categories of income might be more expensive than uh, taxing others. So, for example, administrative costs associated with imposing taxes on capital are much larger than those associated with taxing labor because of the difficulty of differentiating between income and the return to capital. So a firm makes an investment and has a return on that capital or on that investment. How is it that we then tax that return? on that investment? That is the question that arises here. Taxes also have other roles, and this is more of a macroeconomic issue. So for example, taxes act as an automatic stabilizer. So let's say that an economy goes into a recession. When an economy is in recession, people are earning less. So therefore they are paying less in terms of taxes. Because you are getting tax tax less all of a sudden, what happens is that this acts as a stimulus for the economy. So what you are seeing is an automatic stabilization so that when income drops as a result of a recession, the average tax rate is reduced. On the other hand, there's also the risk that an economy can overheat during the time of a boom. So uh, that means that you pay more taxes during a boom. And again, this acts as a break that prevents the economy from overheating. To give you an example, during the, tire, the, during the period of recession, let's say you're earning £100 and the tax rate is um, 10%, you'd be paying £10. But on the other hand, when your income declines due to a recession to, let's say, £80, now all of a sudden you're paying £8. So that means you're paying less in taxes. You have an additional £2 to spend. So there is an offset of the recessionary effects due to this automatic stabilization function of taxes. However, changing taxes and adjusting taxes is not easy due to the nature of the political process. So, for example, one could argue, should the rich be taxed more or should the rich be taxed uh, the same as the poor at a specific rate? Let's say one gets taxed at 20%. In other words, should all rates be increased proportionally or are the rich or poor already bearing a disproportionately large share of the tax burden? so that the taxes should be increased less than proportionally. So these are the arguments that arise. And as you can imagine, due to the complexity of the uh, political process, it is difficult to adjust taxes. Then we also have the question of the speed of adjustment. Uh, even though if you can change taxes, the speed with which these changes are seen or reflected in the collection of revenues and uh, in the provision of funds for government expenditure takes time. It doesn't occur instantly. You might lower the tax rate, hence giving people more money to spend, but the effect of that increased spending by consumers is not going to be seen immediately. Alternatively, you increase taxes, that impact is not going to be seen either immediately in terms of the collection of funds. So if you are dealing with an economy that fluctuates rapidly, these lags may limit the efficacy of the income tax in stabilizing the economy. A desirable characteristic of the tax system is that it is transparent and that it is responsible. So individuals should not try to take an advantage of uninformed citizens. This is also tied into uh, an honest and clean government. Uh, otherwise, what happens is the politicians raise taxes to pay for expenditure that should not have been undertaken. So this view of a transparent political responsibility and its relation to the tax system recommends that um, taxes uh, are associated with a clear budget and clear expenditure. We need to know where our taxes are going or what they are paying for. So this is the issue of transparent taxes. And transparency has increasingly been recognized as an important characteristic of good government. And it is said that government policies are said to be transparent when it is clear who is benefiting and who it is paying and for what. That is another aspect that we need to add. A tax system also needs to be fair, and there are two distinct concepts for fairness. First of all, we have something called horizontal equity, and a tax system is said to be horizontally equitable 
if individuals who are the same in all relevant aspects are treated the same. The problem with this concept is that the principle of horizontal equity gives us little guidance as to what differences are relevant in assessing what taxes should be paid and how horizontal equitability is to be maintained or horizontal, horizontal equity is to be maintained. Then what we have is something called vertical equity. And this is a principle that some individuals are in a position to pay higher taxes than others. And these individuals should do so. So there are three main arguments against this, uh, determining who in principle should pay a higher tax rate, then implementing this principle, and then also deciding if someone is in a position to pay the higher rate and how much more that individual should pay relative to other individuals. This one is a little bit easier than horizontal equity because we can ask that those that earn pay more, pay more. I think it goes without saying that what we pay taxes on is income. So therefore income is the basis of taxation. And uh, income is therefore widely used as a marker of who has the ability to pay taxes and who should be paying taxes. It is for this reason that those with a higher income have a greater ability to pay and therefore should pay higher taxes. So it is easy to identify those that should be paying more. What is more difficult is that there is this widely held view that those with higher income not only should pay more taxes, but also should pay a higher fraction of their income in taxes. So this argument that income taxes should be progressive is sometimes challenged, although many European countries and, and many other countries in the world do have a progressive tax system. In other words, the more you earn, the more you pay, because the percentage or the tax rate increases as your income increases. Another argument is that consumption is the basis of taxation, another concept. And here what the argument proposes is would not be fairer to tax that what is taken out of society as opposed to what is being contributed to society. Therefore, is it not fairer to tax individuals on the basis of what they take out of society rather than what they contribute, that is on the basis of consumption rather than income. So that is this idea that we should look at consumption as a basis of taxation. And I think to a large extent, not I think, but I know to a large extent we do. That is what a value added tax is essentially. Currently, the way we pay taxes is on the basis of uh, what we earn in a single year or alternatively what we earn in a single month. And on the basis of that, we calculated what we should be paying for a whole entire year on the basis of 12 months. A concept that is gaining popularity is that we should tax individuals' lifetime income. So the lifetime income is then defined as the present value um, of discounted cash flows, or the present discounted value of individuals' wage income over their lifetime. So let's say the individual lives for two periods and uh, receives a wage of uh, W subscript zero in the first period and W subscript one in the second period, then we would represent the present discounted value of his or her income using this formula. Note that this is the wage that is earned in the um, in a one period from now on, and that is why we are discounting it by some discount rate, which we represent here in the denominator. So R is the discount rate, which is an interest rate. And by this reasoning, the present discounted value of individual's consumption over his or her lifetime must equal must be equal to the present discounted value of his or her income. In other words, we spend what we earn. So we calculate the present value of consumption and that should be dependent upon the present value of our lifetime income. So hence, we can rewrite this equation, note the link here, as follows, where consumption is the consumption in the, uh, C subscript one is consumption in the second period and C subscript zero is consumption in our current period. 
And what we can then show is the lifetime consumption is equivalent to lifetime income. Another proposition is that a benefit approach is taken. So the way that individuals should contribute to supporting government is in proportion to the benefit that they receive from public services. So note this differs from uh, taxing income and this also differs from taxing consumption. So here the taxes would then be viewed as a charge for the provision of public services. So you would pay for these public services in one way or another, not necessarily directly. An example would be the use of fees to charge for the use of bridges and some toll roads. Alternatively, if you are using roads, you could uh, pay for these roads by paying petrol levies, uh, which would be a mechanism for relating the benefit to a form of funding in the form of a levy on petrol. Nevertheless, the problem is it is difficult to use uh, benefits as a basis of taxation. Why? Because it is difficult to identify the magnitude of the benefits received by different individuals. So, for example, uh, I might never use the highway. So why should I pay a levy that is then in my petrol expenditure that is then used to that is then used to fund a highway or a road that I never use? So that would be a counter argument to this. Another way, another example is we all have received benefits from having a national defense force. Uh, however, how do we a, a proportion or a, a proportion uh, individual benefits uh, to individuals or how do we approach a portion benefits to individuals? So for many of these categories of expenditures, assigning and assessing benefits is not that easy. Another objection against benefit taxes is that when they are related to usage is that they are distortionary. Basing taxes on usage of a public facility such as a bridge in this example may discourage its use and thus lead to an inefficient allocation of resources, something that we want to avoid in the first instance. So what are the considerations that we need to take into account when looking at different tax systems? Ultimately, we need to have some form of tax system given the alternatives. So what is it that we need to look at? Well, first of all, what we need to do is we need to look at uh, the efficiency of a given tax system. Um, we need to take into account both the distortions and the resources that are used to implement a tax system and the administrative and compliance costs that are associated with such a tax system. So that is something we need to consider. So what we want to do is we want to consider a Pareto efficient tax system, a tax structure such that given the tools and information available to the government, no one is can be made better off without making someone else worth or worse off. That is what we are aiming at. So we choose among the possible Pareto efficient tax structures using a social welfare function which summarizes society's attitudes towards the welfare of different individuals. And of course, this is also informed by perceptions as what is the social welfare function? What does it look like? If you recall, in chapter seven, we spoke about the, the utilitarian social welfare function, which equals the sum of all individuals' utilities, and also the Rolasian social welfare function, which equals the utility of the worse of individual. And either social function makes it possible to say not only by how much taxes should increase with income, but also, for example, whether under what circumstances a deduction for medical expenses should be allowed. In other words, it also allows us to take into account aspects that are related to social security. So under the utilitarian point of view, what we compare is we compare the loss of utility from an increase in a tax with an increase in revenue. So we consider the change in utility divided by a change in the revenue. And the idea is that this equation is then is the same for everyone. Then under the relation welfare function, there is a belief that the utilitarian approach is not sufficiently egalitarian that pays insufficient attention to inequality. So the Rayesian social fun welfare function has some simple and direct implications for tax policy. 
that increase in tax rates all on, on all individuals other than those that are worst off to the point at which the tax revenues from them are maximized. So we are trying to maximize revenues in this instance. And we do this by increasing tax rates on all individuals, aside from those that are already worse off. Remember that under the relation function, society is, or social life is represented by, the, so by that individual who is worse off. So that is why we tax those and not those, or we increase taxes on all individuals, but not those who are worse off. Otherwise, we'll make society worse off in general. 